Today, I'm glad to have uh, Dr. Hubert Morrell say too with us from the Colorado State University. He's with the Civil Engineering Department there, a uh, professor of civil engineering. Uh, he, I looked through all of his resume. He gave me a long one, so we'll we'll condense it. His B.S. and M.S. degrees came from uh, France, and I won't try and say the universities. <laughs> One of them was in engineering science, the other one was in structural engineering, and then he got a little smarter and he went to Stanford University, got a PhD in hydraulics with a minor in mathematics. He's a specialist in hydrology, civil engineering, and river basin planner. He's a full-time academic faculty member at CSU and has done a lot of different things, including being on a number of sabbaticals back to France. He must like to go back there once in a while and visit. Is that the that's situation. Okay. Uh, very well known individual. I'm glad, glad to introduce him today. He's going to speak about water rights and conjunctive management of surface and ground waters. And I won't take any of his stuff away from him, but for those of you in the state, this is the individual that developed the South Platte River model. So, <laughs> with that, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you very much, Vic. I uh, do not come to uh, University of Wyoming very often, and so I'll take this opportunity uh, to introduce myself uh, to you a little bit. And if I return uh, to talk to you in other occasions, which I hope, I will then uh, not have the need to uh, have introductory uh, statement. So uh, to introduce myself, I, I will define myself, and uh, I will uh, mention a few things about uh, as, uh, me, which of course conditions my way of thinking, my way of talking, and my way of acting. I am of French origin, and the implication that this has uh, provided some color to uh, my way of expressing myself and my way of thinking. So this uh, French uh, background uh, has not only a, an effect on my accent, but uh, I tend to be extremely Cartesian-minded to the very bitter end, which is presumably to be a, a French uh, trait. I also uh, do not make references in my speech to uh, such a thing as football or baseball. As you well know, and no matter what you talk about in the United States, usually you make an analogy between you know, your way you conduct your research and the way you lead a team as the quarterback. Well, you will not hear such a thing from me. No allusion to football games or baseball games. In fact, uh, I believe this year, um, a statement or say a allusion to football uh, this year in Wyoming might not be such a good year after all. <laughs> and if you reflect on Colorado State University there, it is never a good year to make allusion to football. <laughs> the second aspect about myself is that I believe I have an American attitude. And of course, that was not the result of my original education, but it's an acquired uh, perspective. So I believe I have an American attitude which means I've learned through the years that uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, viewpoint, let's come and sit down together, was maybe a, a better way of solving problem than to uh, attempt a revolution. I'd like to point out that this year is, of course, the celebration of the bicentennial of the French Revolution. So I have looked at this American and French Revolution from a double perspective, knowing it from inside out, having been raised within the French system and have lived in the United States actually most of my life. So of course all of that colors my, my viewpoints. I'd like to say also that I am a, an educator, so it's not a facet of myself, I'm an educator, which means I teach and I do research, and I'm primarily uh, concerned with uh, teaching. And as a result of that, I've learned through the years that in order for people to get your point, sometimes you have to exaggerate so that people are st struck by what you say, shocked by what you say, it makes it dead and they remember. So I tend to make exaggerated statements. So I want to warn you about that, that 
Do, take sometimes what I say with a grain of salt. They may be on purpose an exaggeration, and sometimes what I say may not really reflect my viewpoint. And I think that's part of the French background too. In the way of French expression, you tend to sometimes make statements that you do not believe, but you make as a, in order to challenge the other person to react to that particular statement. A further aspect of myself, I'm a Quaker. I presume most of you, since you are not a French background, but American background, you know who Quakers are. So I'm a Quaker, and of course that colors a great deal of my way of thinking. And finally, I'd like to mention that foremost, I'm a hydrologist, okay? And maybe at this time, it would be the opportune time to say, let's really go into our subject and talk about hydrology, because that's the love of my life, hydrology. So I would like to start this uh, presentation, after make, having made this introduction, with a few slides. I want to start in a lighthearted fashion and then proceed later on with the more technical uh, aspect. Though I will not be highly technical today, I will tend to, to talk about things that I don't really know. <laughs> now, I hope you remember what I said earlier, that I tend to make exaggerated statements. Okay. What I'm implying by this is that I do not claim to be an expert. And uh, I always like to have on my door a sign, uh, my, uh, my office door a sign that says, question authority. Okay, question authority. Uh, believing that uh, you should never take on face value what people state with, when they do not provide substantive, substantive uh, evidence for it and support their statement with actual facts. So really, I am not an expert, of course, in a uh, matter of water rights, legal aspects, etc. But I have been led to a large degree through my experience at Colorado State University to interface the hydrology with the water right aspect in Colorado. So I will try to uh, discuss with you a little bit aspects of Colorado water law, Colorado water rights, that you cannot ignore if you're going to be dealing with hydrologic model uh, with the ultimate goal of having that model applicable for solution of practical problem of concern to the state of Colorado. So I learned that you know, sort of the hard way throughout my career at Colorado State University. So let's proceed now with uh, the slides. And which will provide a sort of a pictured uh, introduction to water law. This picture is taken in the Rewa Wilderness area, and I believe it's in Colorado, though I presume some of it may be in, in Wyoming. Is it entirely in Colorado? Anyway, it's a very much northern part of, of Colorado. Now, when you look at this uh, uh, wilderness area, as you realize there that uh, the aspect of water of interest to people who go there is the aesthetic side of water. Okay? Water there is viewed as an object of beauty. And of course, that is one aspect of water. Water in the form of snow, is beautiful. It has aesthetic values. A little later, this is a view towards the Mami Range. Uh, water is still viewed as an object of beauty, but is also viewed as uh, of value in a recreational sense. You start there to start to have uh, possibly uh, fishermen appreciating the stream. And then you have, down the Poudre River, kayaks. And you see now you have the sportsman's attitude and the value of water from that particular perspective. As you go further downstream, and this is the South Platte after the confluence with the Poudre River, by that time, water is regarded more and more as an economic commodity. It's a mostly of use as an economic uh, commodity. 
and it's used has been allocated by the uh, state of Colorado according to a simple rule uh, first in time first in right so if you uh, came to Colorado in the early days say in the 1850s and you made claim to water then you have the right to it and if there's a shortage of water you're a right must be satisfied before anybody else has a right to that water. And that is, is, is irrespective of where, whether you're further downstream or very much upstream, regardless of where lo your location is, your water right must be satisfied before any other water right is satisfied. Water rights that are junior to yours since you were there first. Now here is the sterling number one diversion dish, which takes water from the plot and diverts it to uh, a district for use. Now, as I said earlier, you can see as by now, the aesthetic aspect of the things have been to a large degree uh, overlooked. This water then is used uh, primarily in Colorado for irrigation. I think 90% of the water in Colorado is still used for agricultural purposes. So we're essentially in terms of water use, an agricultural state. And you see here that uh, people use techniques of irrigation that uh, some people in some sectors would refer to as kind of wasteful, uh, put a lot of water over the irrigated field. This is the way the plot looks uh, downstream from the diversion point. And you start to see here that there's not a lot of water left downstream for many of these diversion points. And you can see that the relatively arid character of the area. And uh, because, of course, of shortage of water, people have started to think, as years went on, on and population increase, at means of uh, increasing the water supply. Now, this picture is the um, release canal from the horse tooth uh, reservoir. And he shows that in order to uh, increase the water supply, people have been thinking primarily of uh, so storage of water in surface reservoirs. And of course, when you look at the areas, you get a feeling for the uh, rather arid nature of the state. People get somewhat desperate, and I sort of suggest that uh, a way of saving water would be to cut down the phreatophytes along the river banks. Uh, unfortunately for these people, when the matter came to courts, the uh, Colorado uh, Supreme Court decided, oh no, you cannot claim water save because you cut down trees. And the reasoning of the uh, Colorado Supreme Court on that was the trees were thieves in the first place. So, uh, I forgot the term exactly, but in other words, if you uh, if you buy from somebody something that you know has been stolen, uh, the acquisition of that property is illegal. Is that correct? What is the word for that? Uh, all right. So basically, the, the Supreme Court says, if you claim a water right on cutting trees, the trees were thieves. They were stealing water they had no right to. All right. And consequently, you cannot uh, cut trees, presumably save water, and claim it. If you cut the trees, maybe more water will be available, but it is not yours. It's already the right of people. So cutting down phreatophytes uh, hasn't been, fortunately, from an aesthetic point of view, has not been a means of increasing water supply. This is uh, a diversion point for sterling number two. And this is uh, in Colorado, uh, sort of a halfway point between, say, uh, Greeley and the border with Nebraska, it's turning on, on the Platte. This is upstream of the second sterling uh, irrigation um, diversion point. And you see here, there's more water than what appears to be downstream from diversion point number one. And so this is a characteristic of a plot as you go downstream from diversion points you see very little water, and as you gradually go down the stream, more and more water is flowing, and the implication is now return flows. Now, of course, the big problem, many times, is a decision whether these return flows are surface return flows, or they are aquifer return flows. And that determination is not a very easy one. Now, this is 
way the water is being used, and you can see here that the irrigation technique is a little bit more advanced than uh, what I saw earlier. And this is downstream of that diversion point. Now, you realize here again that we have, to a large degree, uh, a river that is uh, fairly dry. If, again, if you go further downstream, you find the flows will be increasing. This is kind of a general statement because that depends also on uh, time of year. Now, as the years went by, and given you see that this South Platte certainly is not the Mississippi River, there was shortage of water for people who had junior rights, so they thought, well, why don't we tap the groundwater? And you'll notice where well, this uh, groundwater is tapped is right in the vicinity of where the river is. Okay, here's the South Platte River. Okay, and here are all these uh, plots irrigated with groundwater. Well, it took people a long time to realize that maybe surface and groundwaters are not independent source of water. There may be a relationship between the two. A lot of the wells came in during the drought period of the 30s and the 50s. It is not until 1969 that the Colorado State Legislature passed the, uh, what they refer to as the Water Resources Act of 1969 that recognized the interaction between surface and groundwaters and uh, demanded, or let's say, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but anyway, indicated to the state engineers that they had to administer and adjudicate water rights for surface and groundwater in an integrated fashion. And as a result of that 1969 act, all the wells were declared junior rights relative to the surface water rights. The reason being that the surface water rights in Colorado, many of them are very old water rights, and the wells didn't come until the 1930s and the 1950s when practically the South Platte River was over adjudicated. Okay, so the, all these wells are essentially junior for practical purpose to all surface water rights. And now they were, at, were to be administered and adjudicated in an integrated way. What did that mean? Well, if you read the law and we'll take a look at the Colorado law, you realize that if you interpret the law in a very narrow sense, that leaves the state engineer very little option but to tell the people who have well to shut them down. That is a sort of narrow interpretation of the law, but it is following what the law says. Of course, that doesn't make a lot of people very happy, particularly those who have wells. But there is also some advantage to the use of wells relative to surface irrigation that maybe people tend to use, especially with that uh, center pivot procedures, a little bit more efficient procedures for irrigation. Now, I like to, uh, that may be you know, the French aspect of myself, I like to philosophize. I like to bring philosophic elements. And I like then to ask a sort of esoteric question there. You look at that water and tell me, is that surface water or, is that surface water or groundwater? All right? Can you tell from looking at it whether it's surface or groundwater? Anyone here dare, dares to make a statement? Is that surface water or is that groundwater? Huh? I think groundwater is the act of becoming surface water. <laughs> well, uh, when it's flowing in the pipe here, is it surface water or groundwater? Okay. Well, I'm not going to answer that question. The point I'm trying to make is the division between surface and groundwater is futile and absurd. Water is water, and there's no such a thing as surface and groundwater. It's the same thing. So the distinction between these two short of water is a sort of uh, arbitrary and futile. This water was pumped indeed from a well at a relatively short distance from there. It was piped through this pipe and only dumped in the irrigation canal. Why was that done? It was done because the surface flows in the pipe at that uh, diversion point for this canal were too low to divert water so that surface water right could not be met from the river. So what is available to that particular uh, ditch company 
is a well that was drilled for the purpose of an augmentation plan. The augmentation plan is the one flexible aspect of the Colorado water law. It says if you have a junior right and you exercise it, and the exercise of your junior right causes damage to a senior water right, you have to compensate for it. Okay. But the compensation doesn't require that you stop pumping because your pumping causes the damage. It only says that you must compensate for the damage. So you can keep pumping provided you have a plan by which when the damage is clear and of course caused by you, you make up for the damage. But the source of water to make up the damage is sort of irrelevant. You could make up for the damage by buying somebody's surface water rights, which are seniors, or you could draw from the aquifer, pipe it, dump it in the ditch, and then meet the water right. So this is an augmentation plan, an augmentation well, which was drilled by the groundwater appropriators of the South Platte to meet the uh, requirements of the law and make up for the damage they are doing. Of course, the big question is how much damage are these gas wells doing? Well, it's still an open question that hasn't been answered. How do you assess the damage done by a well? I believe this is the last slide. Let me check. It is. So we'll be done. We're done with slides. Let me bring the light back up and then turn this off. The question is, how do you assess damage to stream flow due to pumping from wells? Now, if you deal with surface water, you can measure flows, you can see the water, you can measure its velocity, you can estimate the discharge. That's very clear. When we deal with groundwater, we cannot see it, okay? Now, of course, when you deal with legislatures and all these doubting Thomases there, it's obvious if you can't see it, it's hard to believe. You can't see it. Second, we have no ways of measuring velocity in aquifers. We have techniques to infer from other measurements what the velocities are but we never measure directly velocities. In streams, we can directly measure velocities. We don't have to infer velocities, we can measure velocity. In uh, aquifers, we make indirect observation from which we infer what these velocities are. We do not measure them. And as a result of that, there's no way you can measure the influence of pumping on stream flows. And that brings to the fact, which of course is good for my profession, you can do without modelers. You cannot do without modeling the system to make estimates of this particular situation. How do you reduce steam flows from pumping from a particular well? All right? So, People like myself, who are very much in uh, hydrologic modeling, are faced with a situation we are needed, but we are not wanted. Okay? We are needed, but we are not wanted. Clearly, we are needed because people can make such estimate without models, but we are not wanted because since what we calculate is not something you can go and see and measure, we have a tremendous credibility gap, all right? Now, I have worked on this kind of problem starting back uh, roughly in the 1972s. I don't believe yet I have been able to become credible with the state engineer's office. That was 72, in 72, so figure out how many years that is. About 17 years I've attempted, I don't think I've yet gained credibility with the state engineer's office. And the proof of it is their funding of my research is pitiful. <laughs> All right? 
And so, if you want to uh, assess objectively what credibility I've obtained, if you look at my funding from the state engineer office, you realize that's practically nil. After 17 years of efforts, what I'm pointing out to you is the real difficulty of this particular uh, problem. Now, I would like now to go over some aspect of the Colorado Water Law and why modeling is needed, and also why the state engineer's task, according to the law, is essentially an impossible task. It's practically an impossible task. One of the first uh, statements in the law is that you should maximize beneficial use of surface and groundwaters in the state of Colorado. While people who deal with optimization methods know something which is known, or which maybe I've called, the zeroth law of operations research. The zeroth law of operations research states that you cannot optimize two objective functions at the same time. And yet in the law it says you should optimize or maximize beneficial use of surface and groundwater. From an optimization point of view, you cannot maximize two objective functions at the same time. It's an impossible task. Well, that's good because if we did get research funding from the state, we'd be working on it forever since it's not a solvable problem. There are other aspects in the law that makes it practically impossible to uh, do the task. So let's start to look at some of these tasks. By the way, if you have questions, I would rather that you ask right away rather than wait till the end of the uh, presentation because by the end of the presentation you may have forgotten what the question you want to ask. So I would like to keep this informal and don't hesitate to interrupt me for asking a questions on any particular point. So let's look at the this uh, ec uh, quote from the uh, Water Resources Act of 1969 in, in Colorado. Uh, is that on the screen? Can you see? Okay, let me uh, read it quickly with you and uh, what it says. And it says, in administering the, water, the waters of the water course, okay, the withdrawal of water, which will lower the water table, shall be permitted. Okay? Underline permit. It's permitted. But it's typical of legal document. It says something immediately after that, it's corrected. Okay? Permitted, but not to such a degree as will prevent the water source to be recharged or replenished under. And then I underline, under all predictable circumstances. Well, that's ridiculous, right? You are asking the state engineers to play God. And even in that case, I'm not sure God knows. All right? So, under all predictable circumstances, well, it's impossible to, to do that under all predictable circumstances, okay? To the extent necessary to prevent injury to senior appropriator. I think that is clear. We have first in right, first in time, and we're not about to change our system. All right? Let's live with it in the order of their priorities, with due regard, okay, now look at what this says. Can you see the whole? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With due regard for daily, seasonal, and longer demands on the water supply. Okay, well, I says, who can do that? You cannot forecast the future being a human being. Okay, so what it says, if you take it literally, is an impossible task. Now, part of the reason I went through that is because every time I went to the state engineer's office in Colorado, and I say, okay, look at the good work we've done. Every time I went there, I guess they're kind of a negative bunch, you know. Um, you go there and, and you say, look at the good work I've done. He says, oh, but you don't, did not include that. Oh. Like, for example, one time I described the uh, the water rights, and I lump water rights as several diversion points, and this is, it was water right was sort of a aggregated water right for several diversion points. Oh, I can't do that. We have to deal with every diversion point as an individual entity. Oh, back to the drawing board. Later on, I had another way of addressing the matter of water rights. Oh, but that's not what the law says. They say the water rights is this. Ah, oh, back to the drawing board. Later on, we went uh, and they said, ah, we improved with all you say we did. And here it is. Oh, but your model deals with the time step of a month, but we 
administer water on a daily basis. Ah, back to the drawing board. Huh? Back to the drawing board. Now, what I was trying to do then, I said, well, let's figure out. It's about time I read what the law says, right? Because every time I go back, they never have a technical argument with me. It's always a legal one. You know, oh, but you did include that part of the law. You know, OK. So I decided, let's read the law. So I read the law. And I said, oh, boy, when I see that, I understand what they mean. Uh, I have got to do everything the law says. Which only is what we did. We developed a model that would reproduce what's happening in nature and would satisfy all their objections. So we have now a model. All right, it does what? It treats every individual diversion points as that individual. We don't lump it. In fact, if there are two water rights with different priorities at that same physical diversion point, we treat them as separate water rights, as the law says they should be treated. We go to a daily time step. And we made some stays. Well, but the people say, oh, you made some stays, but it shows what a different strategy of management would do over a year. But we're concerned about the long-term effect. So for us to really consider this strategy, we'd have to see the impact of it over 20 years or 25 years. Back to the drawing board. By the time we finished with the drawing board, we have a model which we have called Samson. Okay? What's well, a beautiful duel, it does everything it's supposed to do. And I went back to the state engineer's office, and nowadays I have to tell you that the state engineer's office has no longer any objection. It has everything they say should be there. However, last time I talked to them, it says, oh, but we can't run it. It's too expensive. <laughs> All right. Well, a dilemma is, is what you want. Do you want something that does exactly what the law says or not? OK? I think by now, maybe people start realizing they have to have an American attitude on that one, which is willing to compromise in some aspects if you want to do something practical and use the, the models. So let's continue now with uh, some other aspect of the law. Can we uh, see that? OK. So he, uh, you know, I told you I was a Quaker. So when I see he there, I mean, it, uh, I guess my teeth start to grind, because Quakers are known to have had egalitarian feeling when it comes to men and women uh, very early within the Christian tradition. Okay, they were at odds with the authorities on that point uh, back in the uh, 17th century. Anyway, he, division engineer, uh, shall also order the total or partial discontinuous of any diversion in his diversion to the extent the water being diverted is required by persons entitled to use water under water rights having senior priorities. Again, the same kind of thing. We're not going to dabble with that system. However, but, okay, again, you should do that, but no such discontinuance shall be ordered unless the diversion is causing, ah, and the key word, or will cause. The diversion will cause material injury to such water rights having senior priorities. Now, my interpretation of this, the, the but there, is implies, at least I thought, that the burden of proof that you need to shut down a well is on the state engineer's part. OK? That's the way I, I read the law. The way it's currently operated, that's not the way it goes. OK? Uh, according to the state engineer's viewpoint. But ultimately, it goes to courts, and the courts decide. And I presume to a large degree, and that's what has happened in the past that the courts would throw off the decision of the state engineer's office on the basis that uh, they were not proving their point. But only the Supreme Court reversed that, and that was a great victory, victory for the state engineer's office by saying the state engineers were entitled to make such a, a decision. Now, what are the factors that should be, what are the factors that should be uh, incorporated in that decision of the state engineer to order a discontinuance of the a particular practice that does damage to senior water rights. Let's look at that. Such factors. Such factors include the current and prospective volumes in and tributary to the stream from which the diversion is made. 
distance and type of stream bed between the diversion points, various velocities of this water, both surface and underground, and underline this underground. You see, in all these decisions you make, you have to account for these velocities, including the underground velocities. Well, as I say, there's no way you can measure it. The only way you can get to that is by modeling it. You have to model it. The probable duration of the available flow, I guess we probably can manage to do that in a probabilistic sense, because in a probabilistic sense, you can always say anything you want. Uh, because if I told you it's going to rain in 10 minutes, uh, in a probabilistic sense, I'm right. Okay, because if there's one chance in a billion that will rain 10 minutes from now, I could freely make such a statement, you know, it's going to rain in 10 minutes. The chance it will not rain 10 minutes is not zero. It's infinitesimal, but it isn't zero. So I can always make statements like this. So that is not difficult to do in a probabilistic sense, but that means nothing. Basically, when I say that, it shows the color of my attitudes. I don't believe in statistical procedures. You've got to deal with physical hydrology, not statistical, because statistics are not telling you hardly anything ever. All right? So, a such a model must be physically based. And the predictable return flow to the affected stream, and again, I say it's the predictable, I hey, mean, hey, you have to have a uh, gut mean uns, you know, gut on my side to do such predictions, but I don't think the state engineer, especially in Colorado, has gut on his side. <laughs> you remember I said I make exaggerated statements? <laughs> you know, sometimes my students forget that and they take me seriously and I'm in trouble. All right. Now, uh, having put this introduction in the sense of what water rights are, I'd say let's talk about the studies we've done. Now, we've done a number of studies, and I say we, of course, is I and my slave laborers, graduate students, as you know. Without graduate students, never would get done in universities. Um, the only problem with graduate students have docile ones. You know, people take a lot of beating and still work. Um, anyway, I, I, at least as a reward today, I acknowledge they did the job. <laughs> so, uh, where shall I say, I and the graduate students, or the graduate students and I <laughs> did a number of studies. Now, most of the studies have been done in the South Platte. I've done a variety of studies, starting back in the years of roughly uh, oh, 75 or, or so, the num number of studies on the South Platte. And we've done some studies on the Rio Grande and uh, overseas, uh, in, uh, especially in Saudi Arabia. I've done a number of studies of, uh, for conjunctive management of surface and ground waters in uh, Saudi Arabia. So, uh, yeah, I can't see this. Oh, yeah, you have that. Okay, well, you, you, the plot, you know the plot. Uh, here's the Denver area. Sterling is roughly about here. And then the Nebraska-Colorado uh, borderline at, at uh, Jewsbury. So we've done a number of Sterling plots, sometimes some parts of the plot, sometimes the whole plot. Now, the did some studies we did with the Sampson model uh, involved the entire uh, South Platte uh, Basin. So I will talk uh, mostly of the studies we did for the uh, South Plot. But I would like first to indicate to you, why do you do studies? I find out that studies are done for a bunch of reasons, uh, which uh, it took me a long time to learn that. I'm uh, learning the hard way. Uh, why, why are studies done? And I discovered that uh, they are hardly done for hydrologic reasons. Uh, they are done for other reasons. In fact, the first study I did, the only reason the study was done was political. Uh, that was in the days where uh, there had been a, a drought in the area of Colorado and the West in general. Well, we're talking about back what years? It was in the middle 70s or, or early 80s. I forgot exactly now. We had severe drought in the area. People were concerned. People wanted to build the narrowest dam on the South Platte. There was a lot of objection to that, and it was the days of the Carter administration. And the Carter administration's days, they say, oh, no, we don't build storage anymore. Uh, you people there in the West are wasting water in the first place. If you were first in the use of water, you would need to build storage. Okay? So that was the attitude. 
Well, I wasn't too popular in the West, and I guess at that time our senator was Gary Hart. And I guess Gary Hart was uh, relatively, at that time, in those days, of course, was uh, relatively popular at, in Washington, D.C. And people didn't want to displease him too much. So it's, it's okay, uh, well, we'll give you money to make another study to see whether you need a dam or not. Okay? So that was a, a pork barrel type of thing. Here's money in Colorado, do a study. Okay? And they hope to stay, take a long time so you don't hear anything about it anymore. So we did the study. Now, typically, since it was pork barrel, the money was divided, and so two consultants got part of the money, and they studied the two lower reaches of the porter, and then I guess, I don't know if we had a little bit of political clout or what, but the Water Research Center at Colorado State University got some money to do a study for the downstream part of the plant. So we studied one third of the river, okay? One third of the river. Essentially, what were we doing? We were looking into alternative strategies to storage. In other words, if we did implement conservation uh, measures, and what would be such conservation measures? The popular one in those days where you line the canals to prevent seepage losses. You line the canals, you increase the irrigation on, uh, efficiency on the farm, and these were conservation measures that were studied. And to this, we add the, uh, the possibilities. How about drawing more water from the ground in periods of drought? Since you have a shortage of surface water, why not tap the groundwater storage? After all, when you build storage at the expense of ready of money, the basic idea is you build storage to use it when you need it, right? Well, the groundwater storage if it is a storage structure we didn't have to pay for, all right, and my big question is, why don't you use it reasonably like a artificial storage that you'd pay a lot of money for? You should tap the groundwater storage precisely in period of time when you have a shortage of water because that's why you build reservoirs. But the Colorado water law was precisely preventing you from doing that because since the wells were juniors, all right, then they should be shut down because they did damage to the surface flow. Okay. But the reality is you could tap the groundwater in excess of the damage you do to surface flows, much in excess of that, and then you could actually provide a greater supply of water for that particular year when you really have a storage. So we were looking at, at this. And then we came up with a num number of interesting results, which I'll point out to you a little later, the results of our study. Well, I should say that our studies made us popular in some circles and then popular in some other circles, all right? Well, let me then, um, <clears throat> since I baited you on that one, let me tell you the conclusion of our studies. The conclusion of our studies was you don't need to implement these efficiency procedures. You don't need to align the canals. You don't need to improve on-farm efficiency. Because what appears to be a saving now is a loss later. Why? Because if you line the canals, they do not replenish the aquifer. If you have an efficient irrigation practice, you are not recharging the aquifer. So what looks efficient on the short term is reducing your possibility in the future to draw on that storage that you've built in years of plentiful supply and tap it when you really need it. Okay. So on the surface, these way worthwhile measure for the system as a whole, and on the long term, it was not. Okay, that was good, people like that, because he was telling Carter, or administration is, your idea is about conserving water by lining canals, besides the fact it costs to line canals, of course, and improving on farm efficiency, this is really not a good strategy at all. Okay, I guess with that kind of conclusion, I was popular. What I was not so unpopular is what some sharp lawyers saw is, oh, because there was some guy named Glenn Saunders, who was a famous Colorado lawyer, and in each case, he was uh, the attorney for clients who were against the building of the Harden Dam. So he came to visit with me and he said, I read your study, and he said, I want to compliment you on it. And I, of course, didn't pay too much attention, knowing he was a lawyer. I knew he was going to start like this. Um, 
He didn't offer to pay me a fee. Uh, and he says, I, I really like your stay. It's a great study. Uh, you are a great professional. Hydrologist, and, 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 and I passed some of the nice words he said to me. Then I finally came to the bottom line. He says, I, your study shows quite convincingly that there is no need to build a hardened dam. <laughs> the hardened dam. And I says, mm, I didn't say that. And I was careful enough to not say that. But I had to agree with him, though I didn't agree with him in my office, that what I study there, in a sense, was showing that if you manage the system well, you don't need to build the narrows dam. And of course, that was not a popular thing to say, even if not explicitly, which I never did, but explicitly from the result of the study, because the result of the study showed that if you manage well the surface and the groundwater, you have enough water to meet the needs for irrigation during the worst drought that we experienced in Colorado in the 50s. Okay? Now, a lot of people have spent a career promoting the Nero's Dam. And of course, obviously, that wouldn't be very, very popular. So, one of the reasons for studies is essentially political. Second one is legal. Okay. And I block that there because some people think water is an object of beauty, as I said. It's a recreational value. Some think it's an economic value. But in Colorado, you are completely wrong. Water in Colorado is a legal commodity. Okay? It is not an economic commodity. It is a legal commodity. The groundwater property of the South Platte, after we finish that study, they asked us to do another study on the same reach to investigate the damage there was, were, the, oh, excuse me, the allege damage that their wells were doing to the stream flows, okay? So we conducted the study, and we also conducted a study about the efficiency of the augmentation plants, where the augmentation plants really fulfilling their obligations. So we did a study on, on that one. So I would say the reason for this, it was legal because they wanted to go with that study to the state engineer's office to say, okay, we meet the requirements of the law, augmentation plans are adequate, so now we can have a legal and right to the augmentation plan. We did the study, the state engineer's office was supposed to do a study of their own on that same thing. I guess we completed the st our studies in the early, late 70s or early 80s. Uh, the state engineer has never done a study of that. They have the results of our studies. I don't know where it is in the state engineer on their desk someplace. But the issue has been dead since. And GASP has been satisfied because their augmentation plans, even though it has not become legal, have also never been challenged by the state engineer's office. So this was a real success story. We have had uh, good terms with the GASP uh, people ever since, and they are great supporters uh, in our efforts. And they did pay for that particular study. The purpose of your, of your study could be purely hydrologic. And not surprisingly, where it is really for hydrologic purpose is the country like Saudi Arabia, what is design area. And what is it really was a hydrologic study? Well, <clears throat> you know over there, uh, the matter of law is irrelevant. <laughs> if, the king, if the king decides, this is it. So don't worry about law. Don't worry about institutions. Uh, don't worry about economics either. Uh, because if you look at the price of oil over there, you can pump from the ground as much as you want, and your price is essentially nil, because in fact, not only you don't pump, you don't pay for the cost of pumping, the government will subsidize you because you're paying water and then uh, cultivating wheat, which on the world market would cost about twice what the United States would be asking you after they ship it to Saudi Arabia, and they still subsidize it. Okay? So we did this day from the hydrologic pur purposes purely it was strictly to find out is there a way you can manage the system in such a way that you could conserve fresh water but it runs out from the escarpment, the mountains of the Red Sea. I don't know if you know the, the geography of Saudi Arabia, but there's uh, the Red Sea to the east, and there's a coastal plain, and then the mountains rise very sharply, and they uh, rise to elevation, I think they go as high as some 9,000 feet. So they have sort of like a monsoon effect on them. So they have quite a bit of rain, 
And this escarpment is, has been very heavily eroded and it comes down very quickly in the canyons and then comes into Wadi with relatively coarse uh, bed materials and runs on this Wadi, but sometimes some of these floods go all the way to the Red Sea, then they actually lose fresh water. Okay. So the matter there was strategy so that you don't waste that fresh water to the Red Sea. Okay, what's right? So we investigate that. So I would say there, that was the nice thing about that study is that our concern was purely hydrologic. Okay, really study the hydrologic system so that you could manage it to conserve water. Another study we did was uh, for agronomic purposes. That was in the Rio Grande Conejos Wedge. I don't know if you know the geography of Colorado, but in the south there's the Rio Grande and the San Luis Valley. And there's a point where several rivers join together. So you have the Rio Grande, you have the Alamosa, La Jara Creek, and Conejo. So what you find there is a confluence of many rivers over a short area. And typically what, you happen, happens, what happens there if you do a little bit of irrigation, you promptly have waterlogging because the water table there is very high. And the reason it's very high is because you have that convergence of stream flow, losses of water from, uh, from the stream, and the groundwater level is always very high. So it was a problem of waterlogging. We're looking into schemes by which we could reduce this water. So it's uh, agronomic. An economic one I don't want to mention too much uh, because that's uh, a study. I'm not too involved in that one, but the city of Thornton has purchased water rights in the, on the Poudre River that they want to send to, to Denver. And of course, they have to transfer the water rights. And so there'll be a lot of questions about how much of these water rights, you know, the consumptive use of water, can you transfer? And so it becomes a really strong matter of economics is how much is it, does it, is, is it going to cost Thornton? Uh, in terms of a secure right. I have never done yet a study whose purpose was environmental. Okay? And I'm hoping with the issue of the whipping, is that the name, whipping crane? Whooping. Whooping crane. Oh, we're whipping. Whooping crane. Uh, with the whooping cranes, uh, eventually then we might be doing some study for environmental reasons or others. So let's go back to some studies we've done. <coughs> and uh, here I'm showing you uh, about the lower portion of a plot between two gauges, the uh, Jules uh, Balzac here, here's Sterling, the city of Sterling, Balzac, and Julesburg. So that was the first study we did under the Carter administration. And as you know, the problem was, is how could you manage a system, and, and the management means either uh, physically, you line canals, or in the sense of operations, you know, how, how do you, uh, when do you draw water from the aquifers, when you pump, when you divert, and this sort of thing. So it was both a management, uh, it was a management study in uh, both the uh, physical sense and uh, operation sense. Now, how do you describe such a system? This is sort of an artistic rendition of the hydrologic cycle as it is pertinent to the uh, Colorado area. In other words, you have to account for all the interaction that exists uh, between the different components of the hydrologic cycle. In other words, you have to account for the interaction between surface and groundwater through the stream. Okay? Since pumping affects the return flow to the stream, you must represent realistically that physical interaction between the stream and the aquifer. Most groundwater models on the market today, and that was especially two a few years back, when we started with the work, and that's probably was true even uh, a few years back, most of the groundwater models had an extremely simplistic view of the stream aquifer interaction. They simply treated the stream as a constant head boundary condition. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. This is the incorrect boundary condition for the stream. I don't want to go into in the details about it. For some of you who are a little familiar with groundwater modeling and mathematics, I would say the proper boundary condition at the stream is of the so-called third type. Okay. Prescribed head would be called first type. These people who do that don't have much imagination on how they name body conditions. They have first type, second, and third type. 
Okay, I prefer it by name. You have Derek Clay, Norman. And when it comes to the um, third type of equations, it has a lot of nice names. One is Cauchy and one is Fourier. Uh, they're both French, so it doesn't matter how you call it. Uh, so I, I, I prefer to refer to it as a Fourier or Cauchy type of bonding condition. Anyway, what that bonding condition says, the stream is not a prescribed head bonding condition. It's not a prescribed flux. The bonding condition there is one that says what is prescribed is neither one or the other, but a relationship between the two. A relationship between the two. Now, I don't want to elaborate on that point because I didn't plan to give you a sort of a technical talk, but that's important. Now, I think that was ignored in most groundwater models until quite recently. And there are other kinds of interactions that you must account for if you're going to manage. And you cannot use statistical techniques. Why not? Because to use statistical techniques, you must have a homogeneous set of data. Remember that conditions when you apply statistics? Your population must be homogeneous. But typically, the reason you make a study is because you are not happy with the current situation. Right? So you want to change. And that means once you make a change, the data you had before are irrelevant after. So the result extrapolated from the homogeneous population are not applicable to a, a new situation, which means now you don't have a homogeneous population anymore. Okay? So it has to be physically based. How do you do that? Well, we have to go from an artistic viewpoint to a more uh, engineering viewpoint. And so that means now we divide the system in cells, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And because our calculation would be lengthy, we tend to computerize matter. So essentially, this is a level of subdivision we've done in the model, in the size of a section. Okay? Every square there is a section. And we calculate, for example, the return flow. This is a south plat intersecting a section with the node at the center point. And we calculate return flows in every such section that traverses a, uh, every reach that traverses a given section. So we calculate return flow at that level of uh, detail, which means that every segment of the river is usually of length at most one mile and usually more like uh, half a mile or somewhere in between. What were the results of our study? Here's a comparison on the different strategies. Um, this is a sort of historical situation. Uh, excuse me. This is a historical situation. In ordinate, what we have is the percentage satisfaction of the irrigation need for the Sterling uh, district. You can see that during that particular year, over the weeks of the irrigation season, there was a definite shortage during that drought period in the 50s that we used for the modeling. There was a definite shortage of water, for, a very severe shortage of water over several weeks. What were the recommended solutions? You line canals. So we simulated that. What did we find? Hardly anything happens. Improve the on-farm efficiency. Hardly anything happens in the severe periods. What was this? This was what would happen if you pump your wells at capacity, ignoring the law, okay? And this is, if you did everything, we'll be combining all strategy together. So it's very clear in this example, another example, that the solution to your problem was not lining canals or improving on farm efficiency. Because if you line canal, what's going to happen? If you have a small amount of water in your canals, well, you save a fraction of the salt amount. But what you get to the field is still so small, okay? So this conservation policy will not increase your water supply on a given year, okay? Just take a break and then we'll change states and we'll come back. Oh, is that, I thought you were going to give me a two minutes notice. Yeah, uh, we'll give you plenty of time. We'll just put in another tape. And so should I stop then and yeah, take a break? Oh, all right. I don't think I'll...